I'm absolutely amazed that this car driving idea ever caught on. Oh, crikey. No, throttle back. You can tell this isn't really quite ready for the casual day tripper yet, this new car thing. It's sort of more suited to people who used to drive traction engines. That's almost enough to put you off travelling any further than the village pub. And it could be worse. There could be a hill. The problem is that the fuel tank is underneath the seat. It feeds the engine by gravity through a small pipe in one corner down there somewhere. So when you get to a hill and you're slightly low on petrol, as I am now, it all sloshes into the back, it doesn't go down the hole, and the engine cuts out. So the only solution is to turn the car around, restart the engine, and reverse up the hill. Actually, I can't be bothered. Which gets me onto the M1. Today, it doesn't get your pulse racing. It barely gets your car moving. Not so in 1959, when the first 72 miles of it opened. Back then, the place was so exciting that people drove on it just for the experience of driving on it. And in the beginning, there was one aspect of motorway driving which was particularly thrilling. It's just a pity I was too young to appreciate it. The M1 was like a public drag strip. There was no speed limit. You could go as fast as you liked, and people did. And obviously that wasn't going to last, because eventually somebody tested a Le Mans racing car, an AC Cobra, on the M1 at an alleged 183 miles per hour. It even made it to the front page of the Daily Mirror. There were questions asked in the house, there was an inquiry, and the following year the speed limit was applied. So from then on, your day tripper had to go everywhere at a maximum of 70. What a pillar! OK, well, if Gavin Fisher at my school is to be believed, this will now do 85 miles an hour. How did I do? 45. Surely you mean 85? No, 45. 45 miles an hour? Gavin Fisher, you lying little tow rag. In 1900, man's best friend was not the dog, it was this, the horse. But with the advent of the internal combustion engine, all that was about to change. The motor car was actually a 19th century invention, and by 1900 it was still just a Toff's hobby, really. But within a few decades it had caught on. In 1903, there were 23,000 privately owned vehicles in the UK. 30 years later, there were almost 2 million. Ugh. The city and the car would have to get along. Never an easy match. The horse was sent to the knacker's yard, and to help the car negotiate the city, new inventions appeared, transforming our streets. And here are my top three. In at number three, tarmac. Now this came about entirely by accident when somebody spilled some tar onto a macadamised road. That is, one that has been covered with a layer of ground up stones. Someone else then came along, poured a few small pebbles on the top and rolled it flat, and the result was really rather nice. At two, the roundabout. America claims to be the inventor of the roundabout, having installed something called a traffic circle in New York in 1905. But it was the British who worked out that cars entering the circle should give way to those already on it. And at number one, the traffic light. It first appeared in 1868 outside Parliament, but it was gas-powered, so naturally it blew up, injuring the policeman who operated it. Traffic lights as we know them were invented in America in 1912. They finally made it to Britain in 1927. And here's a pub fact for the people of Wolverhampton. You add the first one. 
My instructions were simple. Lie back and look at some photographs. I looked at some dull objects and some interesting ones. Hmm. That one's rather boring. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, I like apples. Oh, and that's my favourite Aston. That's the V8. Right, I'm very excited to see what my brain looks like. Wow. Is that my brain? This is your brain, indeed. So you've got a large brain, right? We had trouble fitting it into the template because it was so large, but we managed to do that. First up were the scans showing my brain's activity when I was looking at the rather boring objects. And the results were quite surprising. So all this activity in the red and yellow bits, yeah. that's all activity because I'm looking at a picture of an apple. That seems like a lot of brain being used up. Well, but an apple is a very complex object. You well, know, I was trying to think, think about, of everything. I was thinking yeah. of pulling the end off, biting it, smelling it, yeah. getting and the pips you, out. If you think about it, um, you know, it's got colour and shape and texture and all of those things you can see in the visual image. And that is an action replay shot of my brain thinking about fruit. Probably not a good idea to lie around thinking about all this too deeply. It's not terribly good for our planetary self-esteem. I mean, Originally, we were the center of everything, and then we were told we were just a planet in a solar system. Then the next thing you know, the solar system was part of a massive galaxy, and now, apparently, that galaxy's got billions of galaxy mates. So it's not just that we're a bit small, or even that we're a bit insignificant. It could be that we really don't matter. Lasers are great fun, but more importantly, they can also be switched on and off millions of times a second to carry a stream of digital data. Trouble is, they have a habit of going in straight lines. But put them in a glass fibre, and you can steer them wherever you like. Round bends across continents all over the world. Just one optical fibre can carry six million telephone calls at once. So you can see how this disco light is responsible for a revolution. We can run a business in India from a sofa in Slough, find a soulmate in South Africa, invest in a villa in Cyprus, or watch home videos of total strangers as if they were our best mates. Maybe we should get out more. <laughs> Bear with me, viewers, we got the Eurofighter later on. Back to the cold waters of the Atlantic. The German U-boats that were sinking our ships were usually a long way off. They had to aim their torpedoes well ahead of their targets, so anything that could disguise the ship's course and speed would be extremely useful. Right, the German U-boat commander would be looking through his periscope. There's the Mauritania in its civilian colour scheme. Yeah, I can see quite clearly that's the bow that way, that's the stern. So that's travelling from my left to my right. But there it is with the dazzle pattern. And that's slightly confusing. So that could put you off a bit. And then... La Gloire is actually very convincing. That looks like an optical illusion, as if it's got more than one hull. It could be going left to right or right to left. It could be coming sort of 45 degrees towards me. So that could make a torpedo miss by a mile, quite literally. That's very impressive, even in cardboard. Well, it's not every day you get your hands on a camera in space. So I've grabbed the mission control crew over lunch and I'm going to lay out a picture on their lawn. To make sure it shows up on Topsat, right out there in orbit, I've made it from two and a half metres squares. OK, you need a sandbag over there. Now, all that's required to reveal the beauty of my space art to the world is for the satellite to pass overhead. If you look at this image up here, you can see lots of dots very close to the Earth. There's low Earth orbiting imaging satellites. They're at about 686 kilometres high. Medium Earth orbit, which is about 20,000 kilometres, and that's GPS. 
Then the big ring round the outside is the belt where all the geostationary communication satellites are. It reaches out at 36,000 kilometres, much further away. Do those dots represent actual satellites? Yeah, they're actual satellites. There are that many up there? This graphic shows about 900. I had no idea it was that many. But it's this is a crowded. Presumably in another 100 years, the Earth will look like Saturn with a sort of asteroid satellite belt thing around it. Yeah, that sort of thing. I'm staggered there are that many satellites up there, beaming phone calls all over the place and helping us navigate our way to the shops. And who knows what else, to be honest. So the, the first requirement of working in the space business is that you, you have to not mind looking a complete burke, isn't it? Well, we need to protect ourselves from getting sort of dirt and debris into the spacecraft, obviously. Wow, look at that in there. Oh, don't touch, don't touch. You've got to be very careful around the satellite. So it, that, that is, is a satellite? This is a satellite, yeah. This is all going to space. It's an imaging spacecraft. It's all very, very nicely made. There is no space fluff in here. Whenever I go to something like a car factory, I always insist that I put a bit on somewhere so that I know there's a car somewhere in the world driving around with a bit of me in it, a bit that I made. Ask. So can I put, I really like the idea of putting something on a satellite that's going to go into outer no, space. We can't do that. Why not? We've got to be highly qualified to work on these well, satellites. Not, don't, <gasps> don't touch. <laughs> Few instruments are as weird or surreal as the one invented by this man, Leon Theremin, in 1920. We have one here. It's called the theremin, and it's unique amongst musical instruments in that to play it, you don't actually touch it. It's an electromagnetic device. It has two oscillators in it. It has two antennae on it, this tall one here and this circular one down here. Now, each of these has a field around it, and you can interfere with this field with the capacitance of your own body with your hands, for example. This one controls the pitch of your note, and this one, which is called the expression ring, controls the volume and attack. So by waving your arms around, you can play a tune like this. Now, it was said in the early days that anybody who could sing or hum would be able to play a tune on the theremin. And that was rubbish, frankly, because it's virtually impossible. But you can see how it quickly became the darling of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and people who wanted to make science fiction soundtracks, because you can do all that... Close Encounters stuff. I'm off to the place where the world felt the first impact of the space race, in a rented space car. I love the fact that after just three trips to the moon, the Americans were so annoyed at having to walk everywhere, they decided to take a car. The moon buggy, or the lunar rover vehicle, to give it its proper name, has to be the most expensive car ever made. It was $38 million, and that didn't include delivery. On the moon, its top speed was allegedly eight miles an hour. Here on Earth, the handling is not that great, to be honest, but it's not really a fair criticism because, of course, the gravity is all wrong. And I bet you never heard that in a car test before. I have to say, it is a little bit breezy, but that wouldn't have been a problem at the Sea of Tranquility because there's no air, apart from the bit that blew the flagger bags. A very regular tick. Now, when this was discovered, no one knew of anything that could give rise to such regular pulses. They were better than clocks here on Earth. They thought, in fact, it might be an extraterrestrial civilization, and they called it LGM-1, Little Green Men 1. Well, now we know what these things are. They weren't ET at all, but pulsars, spinning stars, beaming radio waves across the universe like cosmic lighthouses. And each one had a different rhythm. That's going around about 11 times a second. It sounds like a triumph herald with a dodgy cow shot. Could well do, actually. Television changed everything. It introduced the radical idea that everyone could watch the same newsreel at the same time. It's 9.30 on a Monday night, and this studio will be going on air in about an hour. But I've been given a few minutes to bring you my history of television in three short clips. 
The first television programme broadcast was in 1936. There was only one channel, but two completely different formats. And because no one could decide which was best, they broadcast both formats, but on alternate weeks. Vision and sound are on. The station goes on the air. One format used a mechanical spinning disc to scan and capture the image. Everyone who appeared on this format, and I haven't made this up, had to wear blue and yellow makeup just so that their faces were visible on the screen. It was no wonder then that the other system, the one which was electronic, won out. I'm going to take quite a bold step here. This is a DNA sampling kit. It's very, very simple. I take out this swab, I rub it vigorously on my cheeks to pick up a few cells, put it back in there, put it in the envelope and post it off for analysis. Now the idea of this is not to see if I'm guilty of any recent unsolved murders, it's to find out who my distant, distant, distant ancestors were. To be honest, I'm so English that I'm assuming I descended from a piece of fruitcake and a cricket bat. But let's see. Three weeks later, my DNA results were back. I'd been told it was a work of art and that I'd find it hanging somewhere in this gallery. Don't think that's me. That's some sort of elves grotto thing. I don't think that's meant to be me. They can't actually do a picture of me from my DNA, can they? Is that it? Hey? Ah, look, that's it. That's my DNA picture. It says self-portrait, but it is a self-portrait, of course, because that's, that is, that's not just what I look like. That is the code of why I am what I am. That wasn't really what I was expecting, to be honest. I thought it would look, um, helixy. Clearly, the painting couldn't tell me where my ancestors came from, but I knew a man who could. Go on, then. Right, OK, well, let's have a look. I'm afraid you're a bit boring, really, in that um, you're 98% European by this test and 2% uh, East Asian. So most of your ancestry will have been in this region, at least in the last 30, 40,000 years, between India and Europe. So that's still quite a healthy mix, isn't it? It's not oh, as sure. if I'm inbred from a village over, you know, in Gloucestershire. Your female side. So, no real surprises yet, but Mark had one final result which was rather more specific. If I had to say a place where I would think you would be most likely to see the DNA profile that you have, I would probably put it somewhere around southern Germany. What? Is there some risk that I'm a German then? <laughs> <laughs> Might suddenly start listening to brass band music or something. <laughs> We're in Lederhosen. <laughs> well, they make good cars. Yeah, that's not a good enough reason to be one. <laughs> no. Nobody's that German. What was quite like Germany. So, less fruitcake and rather more German sausage. Which is fine. They don't go terribly well, though. While at the moment there is no known cure for being a bit German, the world must have seemed very, very big and everywhere very, very, very distant when it was very difficult just to leave the village where you happened to live. The idea of a day trip was something still quite exotic, something quite complicated to do. So on the whole, most people just stayed at home and watched the television. Well, except the television hadn't been invented yet. Morris dancing then. Then, in 1908, came the Ford Model T, the first car to be mass-produced for a mass market. And the theory was that anyone could throw a picnic hamper in the boot and set off for a day trip. So, let's start the old bus up. First, we make sure this lever is fully back. That means it's in neutral and the handbrake is on. We shall put the ignition advance roughly in the middle, give it a crack of throttle there, and make sure 
the mixture is set to fully rich. That's that little brass knob down there. Under here, check that the leads are on, the cap's on, and we turn the petrol on down there. Lovely. And now we prime the engine, take that cover off. This is the choke, pull that out, give it a turn just to suck some fuel through. The switches are off, so this can't start now. So that's pulled some fuel through, choke is off. Go and turn the switches on, turn it to battery, the coil, not the magneto side, otherwise it won't work. And here we go. Important thing is to keep your thumb out of the way so that if it backfires or kicks back, it won't break it off. So like that, engage. I'm just gonna be absolutely sure that I've got this lever in the right position. That's fully back, so that's neutral, and the handbrake is on. That is important because if you've got it in the wrong position, when you start the engine, the car immediately runs over you. And that used to happen quite a lot in the early days of motoring. Here we go. Yay! Right, onwards to Moscow. As they say in the army, keep it simple, stupid. And driving a tank is simple. To make the tank turn left, you pull up on the left lever. There's a right lever as well, and a pedal to make it go. Now I can't see anything except sky. The visibility is very poor, although to be honest, it's no worse than some old Lamborghinis I've driven. Ah! Tanks are a compromise between firepower, protection and mobility. Call me scenes. Comfort isn't a consideration. I can't imagine what it would be like to keep this up for hours and hours at a time at really high speed on the nuclear battlefield. Ah! But what about my space photo? Well, let's have a look. There's Guildford, and if I zoom right in, there it is. A message to any passing satellite. My version of a space invader. And not a bad likeness, to be honest. Well, not bad from 700 kilometres away anyway. Top notch. Mission Control Guildford, you did not have a problem with that. Oh, oh bloody hell! <laughs> oh. oh, it's no good we'll have to go back up left the barrels on the runway. The Obstacle planet. Obstacle planet. That is the most remarkable thing I've ever experienced. That's how the feet there we go. We've got 6,000 feet. Oh, then it just got my head off the head rest. <laughs> then God has decided to show me why this aeroplane was designed to be unstable. <laughs> I think you've got to snap the head off. <laughs> oh, that's better than a sports goal. It can be 